Hi, I'm Keith Livingston from Bendigo Weight Loss Centre, and my wife Jo is over here. Jo is also a consultant with Bendigo Weight Loss Centre, and we uh, we've started in business because we've got a real passion for health and wellness. Uh, I was a chiropractor for 30 years, and during that time, I realised more and more that uh, a lot of people's health problem. Uh, begins with what they're eating or not eating and we all know that there's a shocking epidemic of obesity, diabetes, diabetes 2 which is uh, onset diabetes and even diabetes 3 which is related to the brain and uh, it's all to do with our shocking diet so we're representing Ultralight, which has been in existence in Australia and New Zealand for over 20 years. It's a naturopathic-based program, but it ensures that you lose fat, not muscle, and uh, it ensures that you don't have excess carbohydrate in your diet. You cut out carbohydrate for as long as it takes to switch your genes from carbohydrate and glucose burning to fat burning. And in that process, it's, um, you've got to have patience. So we talk about two disciplines in life. The discipline of the pain of, di the two pains in life, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And how many people do you know of in your own extended um, network who are obese, arthritic, always sick, and heading for the grave far too early? and dementias, all these things are preventable and reversible to an extent. But it starts, has to start now. This is the current uh, situation in, in Australia and the whole Western world. It, everyone's bought into the medical model of health and wellness, which of course is a model that was invented by very wealthy men in the 1890s and the 1900s. They, they started up the whole medico-pharmaceutical industry and they made a lot of money doing it. So it's a disease model financed by big money that's never been relatable to natural health. And their main uh, premise is to effectively destroy natural methods of healing which have always worked. This is a graph of the obesity epidemic and its main causes. Uh, from the left to the right you've got the USA, Australia, Canada, the UK, France and then Japan. And you can see that probably of all these, of all these um, nationalities, the best overall diet would have to be the Japanese one in, in terms of um, quality of proteins, uh, concentration on plant-based foods to a large extent, and uh, very low carbohydrate intake. they still got overweight people as you can see with the light blue here, but obese people are very, very few in number. So if you go to Japan, you will just will not see the enormous people that you'll see in any Western city these days. You know, Joe and I were in Disneyland a number of years ago uh, with the kids, and even back then, and that was 2009, there were people who were only in their 20s by the looks of their um, complexion and, and colouring and uh, general aspect getting around on motor scooters or the trundlers that uh, obese people have to have. Uh, we're talking about people maybe 500 pounds and uh, at that very young age having to be on these motorised scooters going around Disneyland and there weren't just one or two, there were hundreds. We were shocked. But that's just a reflection of the high carb, sugar based um, diet. Okay, so what's the difference between overweight and obesity? Well, a number of ways of looking at it. 
the most easy rule of thumb for your you know your medical GP is to go by the BMI which is the, the um, basal metabolic index so uh, but it's not accurate it's it's just a rule of thumb so you can have a guy who's about my height but weighs twice as much but he's rock solid muscle he will have a BMI if you compare his height to his weight and there's an algorithm or a formula that they have uh, with a nomogram which relates height and weight to each other so this guy can be fit as a fiddle able to lift a car you know tow a car uh, run through a brick wall, incredibly fit and incredibly strong, but the BMI will say that he's obese. Yeah, so it's, it's not accurate, but it's, it's a start. So overweight is obviously less than clinically obese, and when we start to get into obesity, my definition of obesity, uh, apart from overweight, overweight, you're in a pre-diabetic state. Uh, by that I mean your blood sugar levels are higher than they should be all the time. Uh, there's no switch off on the insulin switch and insulin is a hormone that switches your fat metabolism off and your glucose metabolism on. And it's responsible for storing anything that's in excess uh, as fat in your muscle stores or your liver. And so it's something to be avoided. So that's just a chart of the BMI. You can see how if you're a certain height or a certain weight, you want to really be in the healthy range in here. So it is entirely possible to be very fit and very healthy. Um, and very strong and not even make it into that range. When I was an athlete I was able to squat 150 kilos uh, at a body weight of 63 kilos and so I was very strong, I was stronger than most people in the gym, twice my size, but by the BMI I didn't even make it into the healthy range. My BMI was probably underweight, definitely underweight because Anyway, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Right. It can go both ways, couldn't it? Yep, yep. Like you can have a be very um, smallish bone and yeah. have a lot of fat. Yep. And be in a healthy, slightly underweight because there's more fat on the body, which is less weight in the muscles. So yep. It's more so, like you said, be at the other end. Correct. Muscle weighs a lot more than fat. Now we're talking about muscle and fat. These are cross sections, uh, CAT scan cross sections of a uh, 23 year old man and a 78 year old man. I'd say a 78 year old man who's been quite sedentary in his life. Can you see that the normal muscle is all this dark grey here? The bone thickness of the 23 year old man the dark part is the cortex of the bone, the, the thick hard part, which, is, which uh, he's got a good bone mass in his, in his, uh, in his femur bone there. The 78 year old man has got almost as thick a, an outer cortex, but far less muscle and far more fat. So measuring these, they'd be much of a muchness and uh, but totally different metabolically. So the thing that burns fat and burns energy, of course, is at rest or at your basal metabolism is muscle and brain and heart. So your brain uses a considerable amount of energy just to function. And so that's an example of aging with disuse. We talked about epigenetics and the ability of the body to modify the human genome last week. 
Now this is an example of uh, two identical, uh, identically genetic, two genetically identical um, twin mice uh, with the same gene. One has been put on a, on a diet when it was in the embryonic stages while the mother was pregnant, high in methyl rich foods like folate and things like that. Uh, and th these epigenetically modified the agouti gene. This is a special gene uh, in laboratory mice which ensures that when the mice are bred, you're going to get a yellow skin, obese, diabetic mouse, which is not very nice for the mouse, but certainly this small mouse is genetically identical to the big one, and if it was to breed without methylation of the genes in the womb, they would express exactly the same genetics. Identical genes inherited, and if this one, when it was in the womb, was in a methyl rich environment or an environment very rich in um, suitable nutrients, it would be a small mouse. So your genetics are not your destiny. This is a diagram showing how that conveyor belt in the cells works, basically. Uh, these are methyl groups, and methyl groups are a carbon with three hydrogens attached, which in the molecular formation of um, like a sleeve around the gene. So genes get read or transcribed within the cell. And a, a gene can only express itself if it can be read. And, it, and it's read by another uh, DNA-like DNA um, strand of protein called RNA. So RNA reads DNA and transcribes it and then it replicates it and makes another copy of the original DNA. So that process can be short-circuited and uh, circumvented by epi epigenetic modification in the diet. Here's another CAT scan and this is, this is what we're talking about with um, central fat visceral fat, the most dangerous of all fats. It's all right to have a little bit of uh, tummy on the outside of your, your abdomen, but the really dangerous stuff is the fat in your belly. And I've seen when I used to, when I used to teach dissection, uh, human dissection when I was at university, uh, I've seen some terrible cases of visceral fat, it's hard, horrible stuff, uh, hard and waxy and bright orange in colour. And visceral fat, you see here, this is all visceral fat. The lighter colour? Yeah, the lighter colour, yeah. So we're looking at a person lying on his or her, her back yeah. in cross section, like in the butchers, you know, like a yeah. ham slicer. That's a vertebra there. Mm -hmm. These are the paravertebral muscles in the spinal column. That looks like a kidney, that looks like another kidney. That's probably, we're looking at the right side there, that's probably the liver and that's probably the gallbladder under it. This on here is a part of the transverse colon. The, the, the black is probably bowel gas in there. But this visceral fat is right in the center there, um, pushing up on the liver and into the gallbladder and quite probably wrapped around the stomach. And visceral fat is notorious for um, creating destructive oxidation in the body. It's like a machine gun, the old fashioned machine gun. It's just sending out high energy electrons in every, like scattergun approach, all through the body, damaging the mitochondria, the uh, energy organelles in every cell of the body. And the mitochondria, once, they, once they're damaged, uh, you start to get what's called metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is the syndrome which uh, is first seen when people uh, can't lose weight properly, mm. slowly put on weight, 
uh, start to um, go in the pre-diabetic state where their blood sugar levels go up and they can't lower them. And it's all because their mitochondria are no longer able to function normally. Okay? You see that often when people are wanting to lose weight and they go for a little walk and they're doing some more exercise but they're just not losing weight. Yep, yep. And it's because that they haven't been able to switch on their fat burning genes, which of course it's, um, people say, oh, it's only a biscuit, and it is only a biscuit, but it's what it represents, it's, it's a high import of glucose, and, and of course this fat burning gene, which uh, switches the genes for aerobic respiration of fat for energy, uh, they just switched off, and it just switches your metabolism into the wrong type of a metabolism. So these people, um, if they're an athlete, they're the type of person who can go in a race, they enter in something like a, a marathon or a half marathon, they'll be right up there with the leaders for maybe halfway, mm -hmm. then they crash and burn because they are not trained or able to access their fat stores at a high rate. So they're just stuck in glucose burning and that's great for the time that the glucose is there but when the glucose is run out for energy, there's nowhere to go. And so they go tremendous highs and then lows, sugar lows. It's very bad for the brain, very bad for the whole body. Here's another scan of a um, patient with a fatty liver. And that's the liver in cross-section, the person like in the previous one. This time it's, it's an MRI because the it shows the different densities of different uh, contrasts, but essentially that's the gradient scale there of set to the density for pure fat. And you can see that this scan here, the average density is 38% fat. So that's a fatty liver. And a fatty liver is associated with... Uh, age onset diabetes, obesity and dementia. Can we just ask about a fatty liver? Yeah. If someone has, um, say a teenager, has got fatty liver, yeah. so would that mean that it come from a family diet at a young age and within the course of that 14 years, they've obviously added to the burden and well, yeah. more fatty liver. Yeah. Or can a child be born quite healthy and well despite the parents being maybe overweight and having some issues themselves? Yeah. Um, and then literally being born and starting to eat this bad diet and within that period of time establish a fatty liver that quick? Yep. Exactly right. Um, wow. That's classic. That's an epigenetic adaptation. Yeah. They might have perfectly good genes, um, uh, but certainly s some families have a genetic disposition to put on weight. Mm. But is it just a genetic expression or is it a, a bad diet? Mm. By a bad diet, I mean the typical Western Australian diet. It's called the SAD diet, the standard American or standard Australian diet. It's the SAD diet. That is, the breakfast table's stacked with uh, packaged cereals, uh, sugary. sugary stuff, mm -hmm. things like uh, Iron Man food, Nutri-Grain, 29% mm -hmm. sugar. They've got grains in there as well, but uh, they're grains that have been grown with Monsanto weed killers and things like that, and uh, there are a lot of issues in our modern food, so is it any wonder that the liver is the, the, the one organ in the body designed to chemically clean up whatever you're eating and, and keep you alive? That's why it's called the liver. And without a healthy liver, you don't live to your fullest. So, yeah, fatty liver is just another sign of a poor diet. And poor little kids, um, if they've got this genetic disposition, with continual normal 
what everyone else is eating, uh, they just, just don't get to um, burn fats and that, you know, naturally. So, does that answer you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's just sad to see how yeah. quickly a young child can have these issues when 20 years ago we really didn't see this. Yeah. So it's like the generations are getting younger and younger mm. to get sicker. Mm. And in no. Uh, unwell and fatty livers and diabetes. Yeah. This is happening to children. They're being born sick. I mean, seriously, something has to be done. Well, they're, they're not necessarily born sick, uh, but what was the mother eating during the pregnancy? This is um, what we're talking about with um, the epigenetic influence on, on diet and the healthy baby. So mm -hmm. these days people uh, are educating mothers to eat very healthily during their pregnancy, and that creates the perfect environment for the uh, the fetus, the fetus to um, express full health. It doesn't matter what the genetics are, as we've shown with the agouti mouse example. If you have a healthy diet during pregnancy, as you know, the mother, it creates the potential for lifelong health, which can be wrecked very quickly by the SAD diet. So you can have the healthiest genetic stock you like, but if you're going to feed it high carbohydrate muck, you know, that poor little kid's going to become fat very quickly. And uh, it's quite correct to say that uh, this is a recent phenomenon. It, it's uh, just taken off and uh, it needs to be stopped, yes. All right. Well. This is talking about, uh, before we were talking about the typical uh, loss of muscle as we age. Most of the um, degenerative diseases associated with ageing are exactly the same as the degenerative diseases associated with disuse. It's called disuse atrophy. So we talked about sarcopenia, meaning uh, atrophy of muscle or shrinkage of muscle with um, age but functionally and metabolically and physically physiologically it's identical to disuse if an old person is more as sedentary um, they'll like in the first example I showed you before you'll see this is a 74 year old sedentary man, see the muscle mass is all tiny and the fat mass is huge. So in terms of uh, cross-sectional area or fat burning capacity, if that was an engine, that's a fat burning engine, that's a fat burning engine, that's a fat burning engine. You might not be able to see it from where you are, but this is a 40 year old triathlete, this is a 74 year old sedentary man, and this is a 70-year-old triathlete. And the muscle mass on the 70-year-old and the muscle mass on the 40-year-old are very similar. Lots of muscle in that cross-section. So uh, it's use it or lose it. Yeah. Okay? So someone who chooses to be sedentary and, and has a love affair with a couch and uh, carbohydrates and, you know, all that stuff, a beer. Beer is terrible for... Um, putting on weight. I've got some friends who are former athletes who just love a beer and or a glass of red wine, that's the current go-to. Loaded with sugars. Mm. Yeah. Including the spirits as well, like your Jack Daniels yeah. and a bit of coke into it. Now, people talk about the microbiome, so the most, probably the, the healthiest people on the planet are the hunter-gatherers who still live on the planet in certain little isolated spots. These are the, uh, yeah, the these are the Hazda. Their diet is uh, foraging based. Uh, in the dry season and the wet season, there are two completely different um, 
sources of food. So in the dry season, they eat mostly meat and vegetables. And in the wet season, they eat fruit and vegetables. Fruit grows beautifully in, in tropical jungles, so they have lots of uh, fruit and vegetables in the wet season and then completely different in the dry season because they go out hunting in the dry season and get game meats. And when their uh, biota was investigated by a team uh, from a Japanese university, uh, they're completely, two completely different populations of uh, bacteria because of the two completely different diets. So a biota can establish itself or re-establish itself very quickly and it can also disappear if the food source that it's specifically designed to metabolise uh, dries up. So your gut my microbiome is as unique as a fingerprint, at least in the Western culture, because most of us have a, a diet that varies very little. We all go to the supermarket and have um, what we have, and so we have a quite a small, limited um, or spectrum of uh, bacteria designed only really to metabolise all the sugars we're having. And the trouble with these bacteria, the ones that metabolise sugar the most, they the, they usually have a tendency to be not very good for us. But the the microbiota of um, most most Western uh, humans is about 80% of your microbiota might be about the same as 80% of mine, but there'll be that 20% of difference between you and me depending on our genetics. So there's not a single person anywhere, even if we all have the same diet that has an identical population of um, bacteria. Now this is talking about leaky gut. Who here has heard of leaky gut? Yep. Yeah, good. Yep. yep, yep. Well, a leaky gut is it actually, it's a true thing. It sounds crazy, but it's uh, created by years and years and years of dietary abuse, toxins, uh, stress, drugs, foods that we're not suited to, we might have problems metabolising and um, bacterial infections or pathogens and uh, diseased organs. It all creates a, uh, a system where you get an inflammation. And that inflammation is what we're talking about with free radicals. Free radicals are these very high energy particles created by a lousy diet and a lousy toxic lifestyle. And they machine gun all the nearby cellular machinery. You get the gut inflammation and then it creates little gaps between what should be the normal lining of the, the uh, inside of the intestine. It gets into the um, underlying capillaries or blood vessels which should be having all those things, nasty things filtered out and going out in the poop they get into the bloodstream. And if we're talking about undigested meat or protein, it'll self-digest, it'll actually rot. And uh, you get these um, protein breakdown products which are basically break down into the constituent amino acids. And, and amino acids are made up of molecules that look very like ammonia, so that they've got NH3 and ammonia just needs another hydrogen and that's NH4. So basically they feel toxic and they're walking around and trying to function with a bloodstream which is full of something like White King cleaning liquid. Mm -hmm. Ammonia high, so they, they have a lousy life. There you go, there's the picture. 1,000 times magnification of a leaky gut. You see there, there are holes and, or crypts at the base of the veli and the veli are the little strands that stick up from the inside of an intestine, you know. It's a way of increasing the surface area of, say, what's basically a tube that goes the length of your body from mouth to anus. 
uh, if it was smooth like this table, the surface area, if you cut open a length of gut about as long as this table and it didn't have the V-line, its surface area would only be uh, the equivalent of maybe a smooth surface area of a two inch pipe. But to greatly increase the surface area to allow um, absorption of all the nutrients created in the slurry of digestive enzymes and food in your intestine, uh, the body's got a remarkable capacity to increase that surface area so that if you were able to fully stretch out uh, an intestine that you cut out to the full area uh, that the veli create, it, it, what would you, you think would occupy it just maybe a few square metres at the most can be about the same as a football field of surface area exposed directly to capillaries which then drain into what's called the, the, the portal veins, which then go into the liver and um, get processed. So you can see here these ulcerated, festering, inflamed crypts going directly into the underlying capillaries and, and um, or interstitial fluid. You know, it's, uh, it's they're going into a space that shouldn't really have uh, partially digested foodstuffs going into them, so it's, it's horrible. The, the main thing is that uh, we have to maintain our muscle mass uh, lifelong. Just walking for half an hour a day will do that.